afternoon. I'm not quite sure how I ended up uh, with giving this presentation. Vague memories running around with a sign, I work for wine, and Andrea picked me up in the streets of Glasgow. <laughs> uh, but now it's too late for polite people to leave, to survive somehow the next half hour. Um, never let truth stand in the way of a good story. A lot of people follow that regime, most of them make it to high positions in politics. Um, here we have a good story, supported by brilliant computer-generated images. Rolls Royce says, the drone cargo ship will come. Ooh, five years ago, six years ago by now. Well, five years and two months, it was in December 2013. It went viral and everybody's talking about that topic now. And it's exponentially uh, raising interest and funds. But maybe you know that feeling. It's a bit early in a presentation to say, let's go for coffee. So it's virtual. But actually, coffee is a great entry point to the unmanned ship. You may know this machinery. It's a coffee machine. One of the simpler ones. One of the idiot ones of my youth. Something like, I don't know, 30 quid or so, we'll probably buy this. A bit of glass container, some plastic around it. You put in a paper filter, you put in coffee, you put in the water, you press on. It makes promising noises, something like five or ten minutes later, there is coffee. That is the mechanical engineering bit. Now imagine you have a smart coffee machine. Wow. Immediately you pay 50 quid for it. It has a little sensor inside, it can connect to your Wi-Fi. So with your smartphone, you can start the coffee machine in the morning, and by the time you shower and shave and brush your teeth, come to the kitchen, your coffee is ready. I don't know whether you can buy this already. If you can't, it probably would make for a bachelor project in something like applied computer science. The ICT side is easy. Communication, the trigger, having a switch that is activated by a smartphone is easy. But what do you do the next morning? The ICT works like a charm. But if nobody has come, change the filter, put in fresh coffee, put in fresh water, there goes your coffee. Now this is a very simple system. Compare that to a ship, an engine room in a ship. How many filters do you have there? And already we see oh, sometimes it's not the exciting computer science and satellite connectivity. It's the boring down to earth mechanical stuff. As long as you have heavy fuel oil and diesel engine, forget the unmanned ship. <coughs> That system needs care of having filters exchanged, having consumables replenished, and it has far too many components which every once in a while have some sort of glitch. The fully autonomous ship is fully electrical. Well, that's your first take home message from this lecture. <coughs> If it's not fully electrical, you basically can forget fully autonomous. Oh well, all the self-driving cars rely on somebody to replenish them with juice. Humans, of course. Oh well, fully electrical is increasingly realistic for certain applications. But 
When we talk about the unmanned ship, immediately we have reduced our question to a key hurdle. And the key hurdle is, how many kilowatt hours does my ship need? If it needs a lot of kilowatts, <coughs> it means only a few hours. Maybe you can operate an unmanned container ship fully electrical for an hour. <laughs> it's just not very useful if you want to get to Singapore from Hamburg. So our low kilowatt hour applications are fine. Our ferries across a canal, across a fjord, across a river, time to next docking station, minutes to maybe an hour, maybe a couple of hours, not more than that. <clears throat> offshore supply vessels, long time nothing, go out to the offshore platform, return, feasible. Tugs in port, dash in, dash out, next job, go back to the docking station, recharge. And by the way, this Yara Birkeland that a lot of people talk about, the first fully autonomous container ship to be in operation, probably 2020, maybe 2021 actually. Um, if you look at the fine print, six knots, for those who come more from computer science, six knots is roughly three kilometers per hour. No, three, um, three meters per second. So it basically means we give you 33 seconds to run the 100 meter. I think I can still do the job. That is slow. If we look at the cargo ships, the vision that was planted in our brains with the artist vision, started off, then you can say, you can turn every ship into a submarine once. Uh, if you put all that electrical energy and battery of batteries of today's uh, technology on it, you turn it into a one-way submarine. Thank you, as we say in Germany. So, what we see here is utopia, because we will not see the fully electrical container ship. I definitely not with my lifestyle. Very likely, you neither. <laughs> but you are young and optimistic, most of you. Um, some of you are young. <laughs> Don't go immediately into suicide mode. Small rolls sometimes are quite tasty too. Think big, start small. Let's have a look at Google Car, Media's Darling. By Italian standards, the design, styling, could be improved. We suspect they had a Bulgarian designer. <laughs> <laughs> From the technology point of view, we're fascinated. Okay, interview time for you. How many in this room have seen already something like a Google car, a car that can drive itself? Nobody. How many, how many people have seen a car today? <laughs> <laughs> no blind people in the room. Very good. <laughs> that helps enormously with my PowerPoint. If you've seen a car, you've seen a car with an ABS, automatic brake system on it. They all have it standardly by now. How many cars have you seen with a navigation system? Well, probably you did not look inside. But let's say two out of three cars today in our societies have a navigational system on board. 
And if you've seen three cars, chances are one of them had that. If you've seen six or ten cars, who could say, we we'll vouch for it, they had a navigational car inside that autonomously gives advice on which route to take. Automatic gear, again, you don't look inside. Um, if you've seen 20 cars in our society, chances are definitely it will be one. If you would be in America, if you have seen two cars, pretty good chance automatic gear inside. Cars with a parking assistant, one of those beep, beep, beep things when you reverse a train. Hmm, probably, if you've seen 10 cars, and if you went across the road where you've seen 10 cars, you've seen them. Point is, all these are autonomous systems. They have a partial function, which they solve with a partial autonomy. So in cars, you see a lot of autonomous systems, even though you don't see autonomous cars. It will be very similar in ships. And we move on with the autonomy. We had ABS, which now every car has. <coughs> we move on to collision avoidance systems, one of those where uh, you don't want to pay attention. If you drive a Mercedes or a high-end Nexus or a BMW, okay, nobody with a salary in this room or a student will do that, but we all dream that we somehow make a career and we'll end up there will work most likely for people driving these cars. Um, but they will come become cheaper, and eventually they will be even installed in my Fiat Punto. Um, the PDC is the beep, beep, beep thing when you reverse somewhere. A lot of cars have that now. It goes to valet parking. So it does this automatically. You step outside and say, Banco, if you like James Bond. You have now tank display that that much is left. Um, you will get to what I had in my last rental car. Your left forward tire is losing pressure. You should have that checked. You will have sensors in. You move from automatic shifting to cruise control, where I can take off my foot off the gas. And I rented a car in Namibia. I think it was about 2,000 kilometers straight on. That was very convenient. Next thing is it follows the road automatically. It is handless driving. So, as in the cars, we should focus a bit more for ships on the autonomous systems and not so much on media's <coughs> darling, the completely unmanned ship. Boring history before most of you were born. That's what, 30 years ago? Mitsubishi had a commercial autonomous collision avoidance system, super bridge. Cost around 100,000 US dollars at the time. Was installed on nine tankers total. Nobody wanted it because nobody was forced to have it. <coughs> Extra money. But the technology was there only Legally, it was an advisory system. We did everything and then someone had to press enter and that means legally if anything goes wrong, he goes to jail and not Mitsubishi for developing the system. It's a liability problem. But the technology is 30 years old. Don't worry, we still have professors around the world giving that as a PhD topic out to people because 30 years is good news. 30 years is you find the documentation on paper in something called libraries. Google library and you will have a concept of what that is. You won't find it with Google so for your generation it doesn't exist. You can reinvent all the material or you can find it in translated from Japanese, had in your thesis, and go to the Bahamas. <laughs> but wait three years before you hand in your thesis, otherwise they will notice. <laughs> <laughs> also, 1991, I think it was done, automatic berthing. The equivalent to the parking assistant, valley parking. Automatic berthing and deberthing. Demonstrated with a real ship in Japan. With dynamic positioning technology 
basically all the technology is there to do that. What is missing is the infrastructure. You may need some mirrors, you may need some lasers, you may need some acoustic systems to have precise distance information. Mooring doesn't have to be something ropey. Um, you can have electromagnetic mooring, which is much easier to automate than anything that handles roads. Here we see an image from New Zealand where cruise vessels are there. If you ever come to Hamburg, my hometown, you go on the lake, actually down the river, Alster, on a tourist boat, they also have that kind of electromagnetic mooring. Tug operation, yes, can do remote control, um, demonstrated in 2017. Basically, a lot of different nations in parallel develop their own system because we like to do that. The technology is in the air, the de market demand is there. Every company says, ooh, we're losing out on competition. Our research ministry should give me some extra money. And the university says, yeah, we have cheap labor for you to do that. So we are reinventing the wheel, the Dutch way, the German way, probably the Italian way. Um, Canada has it commercially online. The Mercedes told me, your forward left wheel tire is losing air. And it would tell me all sorts of other stuff, um, engine malfunction and um, whatever, you forgot to close the trunk again. Um, our cars increasingly come with all sorts of sensors, and so do the ships. Uh, Maersk, uh, Triple E class, um, 2,800 sensors. Five years from now, we'll laugh about that and say, ha, you call that many sensors? Sensors become faster, and they're embedded in all individual systems which go inside the ships. We'll have to work on what to do intelligently with all that information coming, or data coming from the sensors. Now, um, many people who are in favor of unmanned ships and say, ah, it's just around the corner, disruption is in your way, would say, Lega Abilkeland is proof. Um, here we have something that is the first fully autonomous ship, container ship, cargo ship. Except it's about two years behind schedule. Um, once it will be delivered, hopefully this year, but I wouldn't be surprised if it's early next year, it will be operated with a crew on board for probably two years where the crew supervises that the autonomous systems work properly. That's very good thinking and very solid engineering do prototype testing and you monitor the prototype, nothing is perfect at the first attempt. That was second floor. <laughs> um, they work on it, so we should in fairness say it's autonomous, fully autonomous ready in the design. Unfortunately, it's about two to three times as expensive as an equivalent man ship. And it only operates in national territory. It has a very simple route, defined route. It's not flexible and where to go and all that. And it's the right thing. You don't try to get seven steps at one time. You don't even try to do two steps at a time at my age. You just have flat on your nose. <coughs> it's called rapid prototyping. You learn from that, you pipe it back into the next design. <coughs> so, unmanned ships, yes, but maybe not as in the artist vision, and maybe not as rapidly as you may hope them to come. Patient, you must be. <coughs> we have certain hurdles to take. Um, the legal people cannot be as intelligent as engineers. 
I'm slightly rephrased that when I talk to the legal people. <laughs> um, always the engineers, especially on something rapidly developing as uh, computer science in the wider sense, IT, are way ahead of legislation. If we talk about international legislation, it takes always a lot of debate. Five years is rapid for IMO to get, we are more or less in agreement, this should be done, five years later, it is in force. If it's something where different stakeholders have very different ideas, for instance, trade unions may not like this so much, you have a lot more political debate, you have a lot more nations that say, hmm, we need to modify this or that, otherwise our parliament will not agree, then you should rather think of 10 years frames, perhaps, before that is settled. In individual territorial waters, such as for Norway, the national authority can more or less do what they want, and it's just one parliament or one political will that has to dominate. Then you have economic hurdles. A lot of the publications say, ah, the unmanned ship will save so much money. In such a large audience with so many ladies, I cannot say what I really think of such a statement. <laughs> but it has something to do with the digestive system <laughs> of uh, cows. <laughs> what we have here is initially extra equipment and super duper expensive equipment because it has to be highly reliable. <coughs> so we'd rather use titanium than steel or something along those lines. You also have to have something that needs to be almost maintenance free. And that comes at a price. It needs to be more Rolls Royce than a Fiat. You'd also initially have to convince insurance companies that your ship is as safe as the other ship. Unfortunately, the insurance company will say, can you give us a statistically significant number of cases to base it on? 200 ships or so? Uh, no. Oh. <laughs> well, we can still make you an offer. It's just a bit. Passing on the risk bug, um, similar to shooting up your own first satellite. <laughs> We're reasonable people. It's good that we have these many, many autonomous individual systems. Because you can say, yes, we have 400 of collision avoidance systems installed, and they work fine for three years. We have 1,000 of this system. We have 50 birthing systems installed. Now we're just combining them. So take the risk factor for each system, run it through your system, you can have a cumulative risk analysis. And uh, we still need probably supervision, uh, human support from <coughs> land with certain qualifications. So in the bottom line is at present, in most cases, there's no business case for land matching. No wonder that the uh, built land is about two to three times as expensive as a normal ship of same size and speed. But quite a few of those will come down as we use individual autonomous systems. Then we have emotional hurdles. Yeah, what is going to happen to all of us if uh, artificial intelligence does everything? Let's put on our yellow vest and go to the streets and burn some cars. <laughs> <laughs> or, or Brexit, or, or whatever. Yeah, it's not so simple. We may even have digital training in the future. Nobody needs professors. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> that shall never happen. Artificial intelligence cannot replace professors. 
we'll have to address those, and I think it's one of the largest hurdles that may also slow down the political process. Then, I am a digital immigrant. Um, so far, you trust my senior title, my white hair, I have glasses, so I must be intelligent. And you trusted almost every statement I made. But would you believe that I don't own a mobile phone? I don't own a mobile phone. Just a phone. Um, I'm practicing. I'm getting smartphone ready. <laughs> and swiping. Sometimes I practice that on the side of my wife. Uh, <laughs> so far, I make good progress. Sometimes I get a response. Uh, I'm a horrible digital immigrant who will be denied a visa. But you, you find these remarks funny because you're digital natives. You will go on board a ship and say, you work with MS DOS. <laughs> <laughs> this uh, screen seems to be broken. <laughs> I pressed very hard, now it broke, and it didn't respond to my input. You will go. The seafarer of the future will go by a driverless car to his ship to start his work. He will not only accept that type of technology, he will come to expect that type of technology. And if he doesn't find that type of technology, you have to pay him more for the cruel and unusual punishment of working on an archaeological ship. So, final wisdom for you to take home. Once a new technology comes along, you're either part of the road or you're part of the steamroller. Being at this university, being in the course that you study, being today here means more likely you will not opt for the road career. That's good news. Thank you very much. Let the discussion start. presentation and uh, well if you have any question we can start five ten minutes of QA. Mm -hmm. So given all the inputs you discussed um, one of my thoughts was actually before you mentioned that uh, the, the labor part so Artificial intelligence could do all these things, but we will have lots of people who are not working anymore. So of course you mentioned that. But give it this part and the technological things and so on. What is your own uh, provision about this? Will it happen? When? It will happen. It will not happen as fast as we think in we will have it next year. I will be seen as a stupid, old, uh, conservative fool 10 years from now because we tend to underestimate how much we will see within 10 years' time and young people tend to be overly optimistic for one or two year period. Um, apart from that, I have been or endured a lot of presentation on digital transformation, disruption. <coughs> We are in 4.0, or some, or are we already in 5.0? Um, the future will not be like anything you know now. The jobs will be, 70% of the jobs 10 years from now will be different from what we have today, blah, 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 blah. Pardon me, it's my age. 1970, I've seen pretty much the same presentation, only they were ripped off on a transparent plastic side. And they said computers will change rather than digitalization. But apart from that, it was the same lava. Somehow, we managed to 
move along. And maybe me learning computer-aided design rather than using ink, as people did 10 years before me, held the process. We formed an engineering force <coughs> that went with the time. Whether it was being able to punch cards or terminal line printers to graphic interfaces, we moved along. And our curriculum moved along. And I think the same thing will happen now. Sure, I believe anybody studying mechanical engineering, naval architecture, or anything there, should have a grasp of artificial intelligence technology. And I actually said to the people out there who are terribly impressed by that, I just did my project on a neural net, yeah. But. So we move along, automation will move along, we have more time, we will gain more waste. Sports centers are probably a future market to invest in. Um, sorry, so on what exactly do you base your prediction that uh, we won't see autonomous ships <coughs> within our lifetime? Because, I mean, that's what happened with SpaceX. Uh, in 2011, they announced that they were going to reuse first stage uh, rockets for left out of everywhere, and within four <coughs> years they were able to do that. Mm. And now they've dropped down the price of uh, shipping uh, objects into space. Niels Bohr. Nobel Prize laureate in physics, quote, predictions are difficult, especially about the future. We have, uh, I may be wrong, I may be right. We have a long list of wrong predictions of high profile people, Lord Kelvin, who's terribly off. We have a long prediction of predictions about glorious futures which are logical <laughs> if you read them now. I grew up with the flying saucers by the year 2000. We will have autonomous ships, but we will not have autonomous cargo carriers, let's say a container ship with 10,000 TEU, because we can extrapolate technologies. And the technologies on the ICT side, they're fine. But the extrapolations, for instance, on how <coughs> much energy for affordable price can you pack on in that volume and in that weight, much slower. And unless you get it fully electric, you won't have it fully autonomous. And at the end, the ship operators will ask the question, what is in it for me? And a question that I have not found anybody of who's so unmanned, Royce Royce, Holmesbed, etc., able to answer is why do you think if everybody is so after your autonomous technology, do virtually all ship operators, all that I talk to, have more crew on board than they are legally required to have? Why do they have extra? persons on board. If we have such a quest for crew reduction and automation, of course the answer is because maintenance is cheaper that way than the alternative solutions. But I may be wrong. <laughs> the good thing is I'd probably be dead by the time you approve. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, why would someone buy an autonomous vessel? Hmm? Why would someone buy such a vessel? Um, let's say for the realistic applications that we have now. Ferries, tugs, firefighting vessels. Okay, firefighting vessel. Because you don't want to go close to something that may explode pretty soon if you can send a robot. Makes a lot of sense. In land applications, we also have that already. So, very good applications by tug because 
you have also safety aspects. Uh, also, you have a bit more uh, situation awareness. You may do a better truck operation if you are from a different vantage point. Ferries. Um, because you have similar operational profiles as you might have with a lift and elevator. Several countries like Denmark, they face a um, social politics dilemma. They have many small islands. You get to these islands via ferries because it's too expensive to build a bridge and too disruptive maybe for the other traffic. However, Operating such a ferry constantly with human operators is too expensive. So they say something, after 8 o'clock, we stop service and we start them again in the morning when people have to go to work. Your generation says, great, I'm trapped on an island. It's so peaceful and quiet. I may flirt with my sister. <laughs> <laughs> no, I will move to Copenhagen. So, the big cities get bigger and bigger and more and more expensive and unaffordable. And the small places get thinner and thinner and die. How can you reverse that? And one of that is excess mobility. So how difficult is it to say, after 8 o'clock, the 10 people from this island, and they're all your generation, they will say, smartphone, this is me, and say, start transfer. You may now leave the ferry. And so the government, uh, for these applications, will probably subsidize that. And the rest <coughs> may actually come from the young generation is okay, fine, like a toll on a, on a bridge, I get a monthly subscription and it's part of living dirt cheaply in the middle of nowhere in the Bundaks. So that is the main motivation. You may have another motivation, let's say for someone like Shell. Uh, if we have a big tanker oil spill, that's extremely expensive because the business goes to BP. Um, so they may have an interest in saying, we install the safest technology and having additional systems on board that add safety, not cheap, but safety, maybe something for the oil majors. So you have mentioned that there are different countries developing the same technology kind of independently, really working with their limited resources. Um, is there any way that uh, this could be combined to maybe use the economies of scale to have the same technology developed for a much greater amount of resources to, be, to share the benefits? Opportunity to unify you. <laughs> <laughs> The UK says Brexit was just a little joke to scare. What you really uh, described was very interesting that you need to rethink completely the way you know, one had been taught and being educated how to be done. And the way you describe it, I don't think technology is really a problem. They will come through, they are the easiest. Thing to address. At least the information it's, technology is not yet. It's the things which are related on that one. The two things I was hoping you would have touched on, one is education, because, because your department belongs to learn, it's competency, learning, and academy. So therefore, academy. all these things you describe need to be educated people rather than expect they will be there. <coughs> because a lot of things, unless they're there, it would be very difficult to see what you do and you can really benefit them. And so I was hoping you would say something about education. Uh, you will buy me another glass of wine. Let me answer that first <laughs> question because otherwise I won't forget. Um, yes, education plays a role, but it's usually overestimated. Uh, the educational challenge is more on the development side. 
developer must be more IT, artificial intelligence savvy, and probably talk to someone who knows about polar regs and maritime reality. The driving of the system for the seafarers, the nautical staff, I don't see any problem at all. They handle moving on to electronic sea charge. Um, I didn't have to go back to driver school to get from stick shift to automatic drive. Nobody sent me back to driver school when they said click on this one to uh, have cruise control and when they have self-driving cars when I'll be a bit older or they take away my driver's license and uh, I'll be fine with that. So on the operational side it's easier. The, the, the other thing which I thought you would have mentioned but you haven't said everything is safety. With had this been built, there will be literally thousands of these built. Mass produce those. Now, if you've got to navigate them from A to B, and you've got to deliver the cargo, etc. Now, collision, I can see, is one of the easy, early problems. But they make a lot of others. But you make no mention. The word safety doesn't appear in any of your slides. No, I just Why? mentioned it en passant, uh, because I was only given that, and I could talk for three hours on this, and then have a little break and talk for more three hours. For me, the main reason or motivation, uh, especially coming from DNVGL, is safety. Um, where, what I think will happen is we will have autonomous systems under supervision. Until we're convinced that the autonomous system is doing the job at least as good as the human, actually it needs to do it much better because of psychology. If you make a mistake, and my dog is killed by that mistake, I would say, okay, could have happened to me, he was stressed. If that mistake is made by the machine, I will be unforgiving and sue them. So uh, we tend to have higher expectations on safety on the autonomous system than we have on humans. But the next step is to let the autonomous system run for a long time under supervision until we have confidence and then move to next step. And for instance, on the safety side, I think there will be much faster accepted. To prove they make things safer for the seafarers, there will not be any objection from the trade unions. We have already a highly autonomous system on board our ships. It's called a sprinkler system. It doesn't ask you anything, it decides automatically when smoke is detected. Um, and nobody talks about sprinkler systems. Yeah, of course, sprinklers. Fix an automatic play one, but it didn't smoke. Yeah, should have that. And it could prove similarly that certain systems like pollution <coughs> avoidance that is actually improving the safety record of ships, then they will have a lot more political, social acceptance. For me.